Well, welcome everybody. We've got a truly global gathering covering right across the, the globe, which is really wonderful and a great um, band of different circumstances, cultures and languages as we've been talking. Um, this is uh, one of our awareness raising eco care sessions that we've been running this year. And uh, this is leading us towards um, developing a form of eco care scheme that people can be part of and uh, can encourage one another in. This is a session um, about re being responsible stewards of God's earth. And we're grateful to Anna for pulling this together. And there's a number of strands. We're going to hand over to Anna. But before I do that, let me just uh, open in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful global gathering, this family of uh, your people who are all working in Christian camping throughout the world uh, to build your kingdom. And we thank you for the creation and the earth that you have put us in and put us on and given us responsibility for. And we pray that we will honor that responsibility. And we thank you that we can encourage one another through these sessions and through the eco care scheme to be good stewards of your earth. Amen. Amen. Thank over you, Norman. To, over to you. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming um, today. I was going to say this evening, but it may not be evening for you. So whatever time of day it is, welcome to the third of our CCI EcoCare seminars for this year. Um, today, we're going to be hearing stories from different parts of the globe and all focusing on the theme of caring for the land that God has entrusted to us. Um, but we're going to start now with the Bible. So. Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And in Colossians 1.16, we read that all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. We know these truths, don't we? We know them really well. But how often do we stop and think about what these truths actually mean for us in our day-to-day -day life? If you create a beautiful garden for your pleasure and enjoyment, and then you invite me to come into your garden and to have the privilege of spending time there, it would be unthinkable if I were to arrive and to destroy your garden when I arrived. But isn't that what we humans have been doing to God's garden? Not always deliberately, but through our greed, in the name of progress, through ignorance, and through our desire to be like God as we make decisions about how we operate as we live in his world. Since Eden, humans have believed the lie that to be like God means to be able to do what we want, when we want, and how we want. The irony, of course, is that God has already made us to be like him. He made us in his image. And it's by submitting to his will that we get to grow in the likeness of his image, not by making up the rules ourselves. Jesus came to demonstrate to us what God is like, and he was always submissive to his father's will, and he did nothing outside of God's will. So what is God's will for us when it comes to how we treat the world that he gave us? Well, of course, he showed us that right at the beginning of his word. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. We're to care for God's creation like gardeners looking after a garden on God's behalf. And in Genesis one, we read this verse, Rada over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Now you've probably noticed that I put a strange word in the beginning there. That's the original Hebrew word um, that's in this verse. And I put that there because this verse has been translated in various ways and it's also been both misunderstood and misused by people. Some Bibles will say rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Others might say have dominion over. And sadly, people have used this verse to interpret the Bible as saying we can do what we like with God's creation because we're in charge. But of course, that's not what God means, is it? So what does it mean to rada over God's creation? 
Well, rather is actually not a very common word in the Old Testament, but if we look at Psalm 72, we see another use of the word rather that helps us to understand what God means in this command. Psalm 72 is all about Solomon's rule, and verse 8 says he will rather from sea to sea. My NIV translates that he will rule from sea to sea. And the rest of the psalm tells us a bit more about what that rule is like. Verse 12 says he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence for precious is their blood in his sight. That's how we're to treat God's creation. But sadly, we don't really have a great track record of doing that. Instead of delivering, rescuing and saving from death, all too often we contribute to species extinction, biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. During my lifetime, the world has lost two thirds of all its wildlife. And the current global species extinction rate is estimated to be up to 150 species going extinct every day. That's shocking, isn't it? Those are species made by Jesus and for Jesus. But let's not get too bogged down in the bad news today because there's good news too. And the good news is that it's not too late for us to be doing something to help care for God's creation. And that's why we've created or set up CCI EcoCare. Many of us within Christian Camping have a unique opportunity to be caring for God's land because we've been entrusted with relatively large areas of God's land to look after. So those pictures below are all photos taken at Phillips Cop, where I'm based, of groups doing conservation work on our land. And I know that many of you are doing amazing things to care for God's creation. And that's what this, this seminar is about. We're going to hear stories from different parts of the globe of what different CCI family members are doing to care for God's creation. And it's my prayer that these stories are going to inspire all of us and spur us on to continue to care for God's creation. Although our contexts are very different, so the needs and opportunities in our area are going to differ from the needs and opportunities in someone else's part of the world, we can still be spurring one another on towards love and good deeds as we seek to look after the creation that God has entrusted to us. So I'm not gonna speak much longer. Um, I'm going to hand over first of all to Nicholas, um, but just to say, there will be an opportunity for questions, but we're going to do the questions at the end of all of the, the six different um, people speaking. Two of them are videos because it's a very unsociable time of day for those people, so they've given videos in advance. Um, and after those six presentations, we will um, go back to the questions. But if you have a question that you want to raise during someone's talk, then type it into the chat so that you don't forget it, and we'll come back to all those questions at the end. So thank you very much to all our speakers, and I'm going to hand over now to Nicholas. Good evening or good day, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I just want to share a little bit of our story. We won't have enough time. Um, but our story is of um, Mulmansuk. That is um, where we live and where we do camps, amongst others. And um, I'm going to just walk you through a few slides and then just uh, say a few things as we do that. So Mormon Sook uh, was first lived on in 1829 and uh, it became a commercial farm and um, it was used to um, used for uh, cash crops uh, most of the time and um, it consists of 3,300 hectares and in 1994 after a long time of conservation we were declared as a South African national heritage site so or a natural heritage site. Um, we have a few focus areas of which is ecotourism and then livestock cat, game and cattle and horses but then we also do all kinds of camps uh, on, on the property. And um, 
this is just a few pictures of um, my father-in-law and he arrived um, on the farm and he continued the farming um, legacy, but we have such bad um, uh, soil. So just, just want to show you that mountain in the back here, uh, of the picture here is a prominent peak and you'll see it's the same mountain at the back of these cornfields um, where the land was plowed. Um, but the farm produced in our area um, the most um, highest yield of wheat, uh, the most milk was a dairy for 27 years and also uh, wool. So it was a, a proper commercial farm. And, um, but, you know, it, it was just not a sustainable model for us anymore because there was a, a lot of things just working against us. And um, also the family, we had a, just a real awareness of God uh, calling us in a bigger way to take care of creation. Um, and, and so we started implementing a, a model of change specifically in three areas. Looking at the planet, the people, and the profit, we call it the triple bottom line, where we wanted to see um, healing and restoration in all three of those areas. And um, not focusing on profit uh, uh, as the only um, bottom line that we're looking at. And for us, there was a big question to start asking, what was the original purpose of the land that we are stewarding? What, what was it created for? And the way it was used currently, there was such a big disconnect from, from those two thoughts. And we had to find a strategy to alarm our farm, align our farming activities to the original intended goal of the land. And um, that's a very bad picture, but it shows the Mormonsuk Valley where it was plowed uh, without contouring and we, we're exporting one of our highest, um, most valuable assets in our topsoil. And um, it went, after a rainy season, there was all this topsoil that went um, out of the farm and muddy water. And um, it was just a horrible situation. And for us, we came to a realization that, you know, we had to start taking care of this. There was a process started um, in 1982 try and um, we build a lot of dams in the area. That picture is a, a before and a after of the same spot on the farm. Um, and it, it just a big um, effort went into trying to bring it back to as original, uh, as close to the original as possible, which we will never be able to do, but it continues to be our aim. And Mormons who currently is a 50 year project of uh, you know, just restoration in terms of the natural surrounding area. Um, in the top left, you can see a picture where we're riding um, high on top of the mountain. It was taken in 2013 already, and it's the same um, valley in the background that was still before. Um, but we started doing pastures, um, took out all cash crops um, and there was a change over to livestock and then even the livestock was changed over to utilizing the, the pastures with, with game and we breed horses and all of it worked together to really create a model where the redemptive gift of this piece of land is to create water where um, we um, restored some dongas, dongas on the farm on the land and um, we are now in a place where we are creating clean water for people downstream. Um, a couple of years ago, we had an incredible rainy season this last year, almost the same, where we had twice the amount of rain that we usually have. And um, you could go to the end of the farm, and there's now a lot more to say than this, but the whole process, you can go to the end of the farm, farm and scoop out water in a glass and just drink it now um, as to opposed to where that earlier picture where the water was so muddy and we were just exporting our topsoil. So in the whole process we've learned a lot of things um, you know um, and, and 
um, it, 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 it's, it's much more than, you know, I can say in six minutes or seven minutes. But uh, for us, I think the big thing was to realize that um, the land had an intended purpose and that we were so far using it for something that was so far removed from the intended purpose. And how could we try and align that with all the practices that we have on the farm to bring it back to that original intended purpose? So, so that's um, kind of what I have in short. Thank you, Nicholas. That's fantastic. Charles from Kenya is our next speaker. Thank you, Anna. Um, and thank you for this uh, uh, seminar. Um, I'm going to share the window story. Um, Wendo is located in the Rift Valley uh, of um, Kenya in a small town called Nakuru, about three hours west um, of Nairobi, the main city. Um, and the next slide will just uh, show you a picture of myself and my good wife, Evelyn, um, who um, jointly have got the stewardship of this project. Um, it's been um, something that I'm thankful to God for, having come from a business background and being city dwellers, uh, that she and my two children, Mwai and Mumbi, agreed to uh, relocate to come out so that we can uh, be stewards here out in Wendo. Um, so the next slide will show you what our land looked like uh, back in 2008, before we were envisioned in a CCI worldwide um, training seminar that happened in Kenya. Uh, through which I got to get introduced to Christian camping, um, something that brought clarity and direction to the vision that God was laying in our hearts. Um, and through that, um, we came back to this land that was uh, located in an agricultural zone um, with um, mechanical farming, um, with tractors uh, resulting in the cutting and felling of trees. Um, and found that uh, we needed to restore the land by planting um, as many trees as we could that were native uh, to this general area uh, in order to protect the soils from the wash um, and equally try and uh, bring about a changed attitude in the entire village uh, that was highly dependent on uh, um, you know, farming and application of chemicals uh, for their for their um, agriculture, due to the uh, erosion of the soils. So on and around 2008, we started replanting, um, and what you can see there is pitted holes uh, for the exercise that we started. At the far back, you can see still some more corn that was still standing. Um, we came into partnership with our local church in Nairobi and excited them uh, into a participatory planting. Um, started propagating the trees and inviting families from Nairobi um, to come out to join in programs that were essentially tree planting, but ended up helping uh, families bond, uh, fathers and sons, um, and the youth get excited about uh, reforestation. Um, and with that came a lot of energy and we pitted uh, many, many holes we collected in our research, we had uh, ascertained that there were over 500 different species of indigenous trees. Um, and we've been collecting them and so far have planted about 121 different species of native trees. And it reintroduced equally a lot of bushes and shrubs. And one of the first uh, um, uh, offshoots of this project has been our beekeeping. Uh, we set up an apiary. Um, and have been expanding it um, and has been one of our sustainability projects, giving us um, income as we continue with this project because we are able to um, collect our own honey and uh, bottle it here on site. Um, and we have a brand called Haradari, which uh, we bottle right here. And Haradari is Swahili for mustard seed. Um, and because of the rich um, trees and, and the flora that is native that we have replanted, this honey is very, very rich, um, both organic and very, very rich in medicinal value uh, resulting from you know, just the environment. 
So one of the things we've done is to expand this knowledge to the local village, the children of the village also being involved in uh, just getting to know how to uh, be involved in beekeeping for their own um, uh, future development, uh, and also for helping us uh, keep these pollinators that are very effective in this agricultural area uh, multiplying. Um, and we're thanking God because we have an abundance of bees now, and so have we about 47 different species of birds that have come back and the ecosystem generally is uh, healing. Um, and above that, because of being able to bring along the village and the children of this area because of the programs that we have uh, that intersect with their needs, largely uh, literacy and the fact that we have a, um, a library here on, on, on campus. Um, they've been uh, with us all the way from the very beginning understanding the entire process of healing that is coming upon this land, which they treasure and own because uh, a lot of programs for them are hosted here. Uh, the children here call this project Mazingira, which is Swahili for mustard seed. This is uh, the, the uh, current state of the land uh, from 14 years back. Uh, we have loans that are lush, the trees and the bushes and the hedges maturing. And now we are exploring ways of making the botanical garden become interactive for users. So we have uh, created um, through our research um, now tags that would be able to allow for users to be able to interact with the entire arboretum as they uh, visit uh, with QR coding that is allowing the use of smartphones to uh, direct them to a website that has um, the cultural, uh, traditional medicinal uses of all these trees. Um, that way also expanding this knowledge that is fast eroding in these particular uh, generations and um, you know, with the education systems being as they are, there's less information uh, that is being passed on into you know, the children and the youth about uh, the detail of the wealth and richness that there is in the, in the natural uh, trees and, and the vegetation. So through this tagging system, we now have a way of interacting uh, to allow for them to come into the knowledge um, of, of uh, you know, just, you know, the rich, the rich value that these trees have for them. Um, above that, we um, are trying to research and, and develop the apiary um, to be able to go beyond the honey. Uh, we are now looking at creating this space also to give uh, therapy that is related to the bees. Uh, so now then later, we hope to go into bee air therapy um, and just expansion of the different products that we can get from the bees. Um, equally too, from just this space, we are seeing uh, the need to grow into a place of just therapeutic uh, usage um, by the many different communities that we have um, that, that can be supported by what we have right now. Uh, so Wendo now is a place apart um, restored, um, healed, um, and, and, and families and youth groups, uh, churches and schools find it as a place that they can come out and we practice responsible camping. Um, so the land itself is restored and healed. Um, and we use First Peter 5.10 to encourage also uh, the healing of God's people. Uh, that particular verse uh, talks about, and uh, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a while, a little while, uh, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. We've seen that happen with the environment and we are looking forward to many generations to being healed through this space. We thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Charles. Wow. I wish I could come and visit in a couple of weeks time when you have your conference. It sounds amazing. Most welcome. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move on to Colin next. Colin's based in Canada. So this is uh, Katepo Lake Camp. We're in the about the middle of Canada, a little bit more on the west than the east side. And our property is 106 acres. And the amount we use is just about that little red dot there in the middle is where we have all our buildings and run summer camps. Um, this black area to the right is the lake. And uh, this white spot right here in the center is 
the remains of our gravel pit, and you can see that it kind of extended a little larger in the past. We're a glacier till, which meant that glaciers stopped here and deposited large amounts of gravel. And when that gravel melted, it washed out this uh, river system and lake system. So there's a hundred meter drop from the plains because we're prairie uh, down to the lake. And when you see that little blue dot in the center of the screen there, uh, that's our climbing wall and all our buildings are down there. So now for 20 years, we sold gravel from that gravel pit. There's about a hundred feet of gravel over the entire property. And they dug out sections of it. On this slide, we see on the left, there's a big pile of dirt that they took the topsoil off and piled it up and they were going to put it back, but they never did. We decided about seven years ago that it was making an ugly mess of the property, digging these giant holes in the property, devoid of any vegetation, just the big gravel holes. And there's about 20 of these big pits. Uh, they would be 20 to 50 feet deep and several football fields long, five, 600 feet long. So they're really ugly. And it seemed incompatible with our position as a camp to be kind of a, a nature place where children can come and connect with nature and they come out to the camp and what do they find? Gravel pit, right? So it, it didn't seem to be a right connection. So. We did lose a bit of income, about $20,000 a year from gravel, but uh, we thought it was worth it in terms of being consistent with our principles of being caring for God's creation. Now, when this was first uh, stopped gravel pitting, there was just bare gravel, but it's amazing how fast the vegetation is coming back. This is about six years since this area had stopped being um dug out so you can see how quickly uh, plants and things start to reform there. It tends to start at the bottom of these pits because the water accumulates there and the plants grow but as time is coming you can see that it's expanding up the walls of the gravel pits and so only the outer edge of a lot of these pits are now uh, not covered with vegetation. And as I was saying there are a lot of these pits we have probably 10 to 20 of them on the property. And uh, we don't know quite what to do with them. We've, we've been thinking about different things we could maybe try to do with them, but uh, we haven't come up with any good ideas. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. And uh, we're really pleased with how well the land is recuperating. And it's also wonderful not to have gravel trucks constantly stream of them pouring through our property all through the summer so thank you very much colin yeah it's great to hear of the restoration that's going on there as well um okay let's move on to david in the uk so hi um i know some of you've been to ashburn in place before but for those that that haven't um this is ashburn in place um it's originally a stately home that's set in 225 acres of um, landscape grounds and gardens. Um, about 300 years ago, there's a gentleman called Capability Brown, and uh, he was a uh, friend to the rich and famous, and they uh, employed him at vast expense to create effectively artificial landscape that looked uh, as if it was natural. And he uh, formed this, um, this landscape that we, we, now, we now enjoy. Um, the, the, the woodland extends to about 175 acres, um, and within that, there's there's probably well three quarters of that is um, a site of special scientific interest. So there's some very very um, severe protection on that on that space. Um, the remainder of the land is is grass meadowland uh, and has extensive buildings, as you can see from the photograph. And we also enjoy, which is you can see in the forefront of the picture, a sixth acre. Uh, wall garden for which we grow a lot of uh, fruit and vegetables. Um, the, the main activity of the trust is a, a residential prayer and a, a retreat conference center. So we can host groups from anything from sort of, well, 10 to two and a half thousand. Um, we can accommodate about 200 people in the house 
and then the rest uh, through large camps uh, and sort of festival type events. And we've also recently in the last few years opened the site to members of the public who enjoy our orangery tea room. Um, we want this, uh, this space to be predominantly a gift. It was gifted to the trust back in the late, uh, what, 1960. Um, and so that, that sense of gift, uh, we want to make available to as many people as we can. So members of the public can come and enjoy the space, um, have a cup of tea in our orangery and enjoy um, part of this, this unique setting. Uh, so the, one of the core uh, sort of strategic core values of our site is a focus on uh, land. Um, this is alongside hospitality, uh, discipleship, um, and theology. So what does focus on the land mean to a residential conference centre in East Sussex? I think primarily we're recognising our interconnectivity with all things. Uh, this guides our approach to how we care for God's, God's creation. Um, accepting that none of us have a complete picture uh, in what that might look like. Um, in many cases, we are learning as we go. And we're all at different stages on that, on that learning process. Um, wherever possible, we're keen to take uh, our team members with us um, on that journey. And um, you know, as well as our many thousands of guests that uh, come and visit our site. And of course, we all have perceptions or different perceptions of how well-managed land looks. So for some, it's a very tight manicured lawn and for others, it's a rough wild meadow. And so we're all uh, on a journey really in terms of what a well-managed uh, space looks like. And we're, we're trying wherever possible to take as many people on that journey with us. So in terms of what does caring for the land look like for us, um, I suppose it, it would, I would say it's in two parts. Um, the first is the land within Ashburnham Place, but then I would also include the land outside of Ashburnham Place uh, that is affected by our activity. What I'm trying to say on that is that it's all very well if we create this, this wonderful sort of ecosystem within Ashburnham Place, but then our activities are purchasing uh, power, uh, the food that we do buy in or the the resources that we buy, if, if in creating that, in sourcing that, we're damaging other parts of God's creation, then in a way we're only, we're sort of doing ourselves a, a disservice. So wherever possible, we're trying to look at the sort of activity of Ashburn and Place as a whole and seeing what impact we're having on that wider creation. Um, as I said before, our, our woodland is, um, is an ancient woodland. Um, we have a vast array of wonderful, particularly broadleaf uh, woodland. So, so oak, um, hornbeam, ash and beech uh, would be the sort of predominant species uh, within, the, within, that, within that space. Um, some of these trees are over 500 years old uh, and they are truly stunning uh, to, to stand beneath and just spend time in. And obviously they provide a rich uh, array of uh, biodiversity within their canopy. The, the, the woodland is part of um, an ancient uh, um, deer park. Um, so it was used to being a, a, an ancient parkland and um, the parkland supports or the remnants of it support some, some internationally rare lichen uh, species, over 150 different species. And we're finding that, that that habitat is under threat due to afforestation. Um, so we're looking at actually canopies getting denser, which actually is preventing light, which is the thing that the, the lichen needs. So we're looking at managing that space a lot better so that we can open up the, the, the forest story so that we can allow more light in to provide a more favorable habitat for that lichen. Um, bird life, we've got a rich array of bird life, uh, um, little owls, marsh and willow tits, all um, species of the woodpecker um, are, are present. And, uh, and we are certainly finding increasingly a greater interest in, in bird life. So early morning bird walks, particularly for, for our guests are becoming more and more popular. So as well as, the, as well as the woodland, we've got some fantastic meadows that border that woodland. <clears throat> and what we've been trying to do uh, because they've predominantly just been uh, um, sown for grassland, what we've been trying to do is to increase 
the the habit the, the opportunity for wildflowers to to grow in that space to increase biodiversity and the principal ways we've done that is to reduce the amount of nitrogen that is uh, that is in the fields by by taking the grass that is that is growing off the off the land and that way we just give the wildflowers which thrive in a in a more nitrogen poor uh, soil a greater opportunity to thrive and just to see the, particularly the, the butterflies and obviously the bugs and the ver vertebrae, but then obviously the, the birds feeding off the, the rich diversity there has been just a, a real eye opener to see what happens when you when you just allow that uh, diversity within the within the sward within the meadow. Um, so we've been able to fortunately through grant be able to to acquire a, a flail mow collector, which which means that we can collect the grass mechanically. Uh, when it's not viable to do that through traditional baling of hay. But really uh, what we'd like to do is to introduce grazing onto this, manage grazing that, that benefits uh, biodiversity within our, within our meadowlands. So we've, we're bringing in um, ecological specialists so can advise us on how best we can manage that, that grassland so that we can improve the, the species diversity um, and some things will work and some things that don't and some seasons will be successful and sometimes won't. It's a long term, it's a long term plan that we're looking at. We've also got um, ornamental gardens uh, within uh, within Ashburn and Place. And, you know, they're, they're very much a sort of formality of the, the gardens that would have been around around the main house. But we want to uh, take proactive approach in, in, in planting uh, pollinators. So plants that are particularly attractive to, uh, to bees and, 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 uh, and, other, uh, and other pollinators. Um, and wherever possible, we're, we're looking to, to mulch the ground so we don't leave soil bare. Um, we're, we're looking to nature to see, okay, how does nature work best in managing uh, the, the land? And what we see is obviously that deep litter of, of dead and dying um, uh, leaf within woodlands. And we're trying to replicate that wherever we see we see bare soil. And then this slide here, you can see, I don't know whether just on the top, there's a, you can see a sort of outline of a fence. This is, this is the start of a, of a three acre uh, food forest that we're in the process of planting up. We're into year two. Um, we planted some trees year one. We fenced it uh, 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 last winter. And this autumn we'll be planting up with many more trees. And what we're trying to do is to, to create a food forest on permaculture principles. Um, so we can see it as a way of using the, 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 the miracle of, of how uh, woodlands develop. And we want to replicate that within, within a, uh, a forest, food forest environment. And this forms part of a wider sustainability uh, uh, hub that we're trying to create within that, this particular section of Ashburnham. So we're looking at the grazing and how we can manage that, as I say, better for biodiversity. We've also uh, recently bought, and I don't think I've got a slide here. In fact, my slides, no, they seem to have, seem to have, oh, there we go. That's the food forest again. Um, I'll come on to that in a minute. So yeah, so we're, we're looking to try and create this sort of sustainability hub as a sort of, as a way of providing some education in, in terms of um, how we can work with nature to produce food. And then, um, moving on, this is the this is the kitchen garden. So particularly uh, for us, the the kitchen garden is is run on a no dig principle. We use a, a, a quite a complex uh, composting system. So all our cooked food, all our food waste that comes out of our kitchens, all our cardboard, all our paper um, goes through into a composting system. And um, so we use compost to create this really rich. Uh, and fertile soil with which to, to grow an uh, array of fantastic vegetables and some fruit. And increasingly what we're trying to do is to, is to grow so that, that produce thing ends up in the kitchen. So we're trying to always try and create that link between uh, the soil, uh, what we're growing, and the benefit that we have to, to ourselves. And that way we hope that people can, particularly who are city, based in cities, have got that greater understanding that actually the land and the soil is really important because there's a common denominator with us and that is and that is obviously food. Um, and then just sort of very, very quickly, the sort of wider impact. So, so we see what we're doing uh, as being a really, really important resource uh, for education. So we get lots of school groups coming 
to learn about about how things grow, where potatoes come from, where carrots come from, you know, looking at the woodland and just enjoying enjoying the space. Um, our heating and hot water systems is all via uh, a wood chip boiler system. Chestnut that we use is locally sourced, harvested on a coppicing system. Um, electricity, we're looking at increasing our so dependent on solar rather than obviously on the generation through gas electric uh, heating. But as I said, all our waste and recycling is a real focus on uh, trying to create that for composting rather than what was previously going into, into landfill. Uh, so that's uh, that's me. I hope that's uh, I hope that's uh, what was needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Such a lot going on there. It sounds fantastic. Thank you for sharing. I think we're heading over to India now, and um, we don't have our Indian presenter here with us in person because it's um, he's actually in Th um, Thailand at the moment, and it was midnight. Um, so he sent a film that he made in advance. Hello, everyone. I'm John Paul Devakuma from India, and I represent and bring greetings from Indian Christian Camping Association, ICCA. I take this opportunity to also thank Dr. Anna and other CCI organizers who have given us this opportunity to share on eco-awareness that's happening in India through camps. Uh, to give you a background of India, I would say India uh, Indians who are conditioned by traditions and cultures that somehow uh, ingrain a lot of eco-care or eco-awareness in our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, we, we are so close to nature, uh, especially we have so many, uh, so many temples, monasteries uh, all across India, right within deep forest and caves and mountains and a lot of faiths across India which uh, you know encourage their, uh, their their religious community to do pilgrimages to these places and uh, to reach these uh, you know religious sites trekking and hiking through jungle and forest and mountains so common people you know are ready to hike trek do these pilgrimages to reach these uh, pilgrim sites way in deep locations and unscattered locations across India and all this with a religious idea and they try to take care of this place so carefully. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, Indians across have this religious connection to nature, believing that the deities and gods live among nature, especially in these uh, untouched places. And another reason is a land which has more than 150 million farmers. Uh, you know, they worship the land. They worship the land that gives them food. So in that way, uh, across India, you'll find people worshipping land and nature. So they're so connected. And in, in this context or this wider context, I would say ICCA plays an integral role in trying to connect the real creator, the true creator, and this creation, the nature with the people through camps. And I would like to highlight four uh, eco-initiatives that uh, four of our member uh, bodies, member campsites, uh, follow in their campsites. So I will start with uh, the famous Avalanche campsite in the Nilgiris in, in South India in the Western Ghats. It's the oldest uh, Christian campsite. Um, started by Rod Gilbert himself with association with Scripture Union now Scripture Union run the camps, run the places and uh, through all the camping activities in Navalanchi one thing is uh, they hold on to is to connect the campus to the creator through creation so the treks and the gorge walking the bush walking that is done has an element of uh, environmental education so in these pictures you may see, you know, we have a, a short sessions that happens in pine forest and uh, pine and the wattle trees are not actually the real true vegetation of the land. The shola vegetation or the shola grasslands are the actual vegetation of the Nilgiris but somehow last uh, 200 years back when, when India was colonized, 
a lot of these uh, pine trees and wattles were introduced and they have taken over the land. And the one thing that we do through these uh, camps in Avalanche is that to make people realize the importance of natural vegetation, the natural grasslands which has to be safeguarded and how these alien trees or plants uh, are not good for the forest or for the ecosystem. And we try to tell them the impacts of uh, these cross vegetation and how these uh, further lead to landslides. And uh, these trees which are not actually part of the vegetation cause uh, soil erosion, the soil is not very firm so when we have flash floods or when we have heavy rainfall we have a lot of landslides in these areas and one of the reasons because of these cross vegetation and uh, that's something that uh, campers learn and go back about taking care of uh, you know the local vegetation so that we can stop these uh, landslides or soil erosion. And next uh, campsite that I would like to highlight which takes into initiative a very unique initiative is this uh, the track which is in the northeastern part of India in a place called Kohima run by the Union Baptist Church in Kohima so this campsite again uh, one thing that they do to the campers is that uh, every camper is encouraged to plant a tree or a, pl a small plant as a sapling and they come attend these campsites and uh, they are also encouraged to take part in landscaping the campsites, try to create, uh, you know, like you can see the steps or small trails through the campsite, which is done by the camp campers so that they understand uh, how we shouldn't disrupt the nature to create an adventure campsite, but rather use uh, the landscape to create uh, trails or paths uh, so that it's, uh, it doesn't disturb the ecosystem. And another you know, uh, uh, initiative that I'd like to highlight is by J Team Ministries who have their campsite in, in South India again in Chennai, uh, right next to a, 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 a small lake, dried up lakes around the place and then you'll find a lot of pebbles in the campsite. So they didn't want to remove these pebbles, these small rocks, rather what they were planning, the, the campsite is called the Living Rock transformation center so they encourage the campers to write clean take a pebble prayerfully clean the pebble with water and uh, you know they give the markers to write the name and uh, then place back the pebbles in the campsite before they leave so what happens is that they don't take back these pebbles back to the campsites but rather they uh, they they prayerfully keep it and in a way that in, in, in on a long run, the campsite should also see a lot of pebbles and understand there's so many youngsters, so many campers who have, who lives have been transformed to that campsite. And this again, without disturbing uh, the natural landscape or the ecosystem of the campsite. And finally, the fourth one is uh, a very famous campsite in India run by YMCA India. It's called Camp Lakeside. And the whole campsite uh, in designing as well as the way they thought about the campsite is uh, is infrastructure of the campsite has a lot of eco consciousness. The it's small hillock next to a reservoir, so the whole hillock is uh, designed in a way that uh, the lawns or the open area that they have is used for activities and pitching tents. But underground, right below, few feet under, they have made uh, bunkers which kind of connect a lot of uh, small uh, cabin spaces and that way they, uh, you can wisely use a small piece of land uh, where you can run activities, tents as well as you also have underground bunkers which not just adds to the aesthetics of the place but also with a lot of eco care so that you know you don't disturb a lot of nature to make your own outdoor facility. So these are a few things I thought I would highlight about the Indian Christian Camping Association and some of the uh, initiatives that happens in campsites in India. I hope it was uh, useful uh, and uh, I would love to listen to others hopefully uh, through the recorded video of this session. Uh, thank you once again for listening. Uh, God bless. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Jean Paul, um, we've just got one more short video, and it's from um, Mapleton in Queensland, Australia. For those from South Africa, it's Jono's campsite. I 
often you know, students or, or children, all they, all they get to experience these days in the cities is an experience with, it, with the nat natural world. We'll be going and picking the, the fruit and the veggies out of the aisle in the supermarket and, and um, the farm for us is one way of closing that, that gap. Uh, we can teach where does food actually come from. Bringing school students onto the farm, we want to minimise any spraying of chemicals um, and so getting as close as we can to an organic farm is, is really a high priority. But um, we've had quite a bit of success there. We've totally eliminated our, our need for insecticides in the crop. The students will have, a, have an opportunity to pick the fruit if they like and uh, eat the fruit in the, on the dining room at, at night. The thing about outdoor ed is that it's, it's not just focused on one thing. We, the, three, the three main concerns with outdoor education is to make connections between individuals and others. Um, it, probably one of the, the more familiar is, is the focus on the self and understanding yourself. The, often the, the challenging activities that we put them through. We're pretty saturated over at QCCC with a lot of activities but having an extra 20 acres and being able to diversify what we can grow and the experience we can give the kids and the campers that come here, they can walk through our bush tucker corridor, they can see things they've never seen before, they can taste them, they can take them back and they can be part of their meals. We, we would be, and we have been, um, growing watermelons here and avocados uh, and yeah, groups who are lucky enough to be here at harvest time get to, to see that fruit, to, to see it being harvested, um, potentially to, to even have a go at picking some and as well as uh, eating that out of the dining hall uh, at dinner and lunch and, and it's, pretty, it's an exciting thing for us and, and for the students and we'll find sneaky ways of, of getting pumpkin into their meals to make them healthy. Um, they, they don't often know that they're eating pumpkin sometimes. Um, but not only that, we're thinking about corn and, and other, other crops that are simple to, to grow, but also simple for the, for the students to see, uh, to see them grow and, and to pick them themselves and, and, and just have a go, just generally get out there. We've also got a tribal link centre which is a cultural experience that happens here on QCCC Mapleton where the, the campers are exposed to indigenous story, indigenous dance, um, indigenous artwork and it's a real good opportunity to see the uh, original Australian culture before white settlement happened. Well right here on the farm at tribal link in Mapleton, uh, everything you see here behind us is fully edible, fully useful. Or, or really valuable for not only Indigenous peoples of Australia, but to all peoples of Australia. We planted this food forest here. Pretty much everything in here is, is good, like midgen berries, and we've got cotton tree, and we've got lemon lime, lemon myrtle, and uh, midgen, and uh, Fraser Island apples, and, and, and finger limes, and all kinds of really, really great stuff. From the ground up, from the ground cover upwards, it's all useful. So native violets down the bottom, and then coming up to the midgem, we've got the Fraser Island apples, and then right at the top there we've got the cotton tree to keep it all together. Uh, we love being in and around nature, it's the whole kind of theme in here uh, at Tribelink and um, also over the farm there. This is one of our main performances areas, you know, we come down here, we do day programs, we do night programs. What we do is we get participants to come on stage with us, to dance with us. We don't just talk about Aboriginal artifacts and, and we don't just talk about things like that, we, we just touch, taste and feel. And uh, the participants, we really want you to come up here, make yourselves at home, come and experience Tribalink, QCCC, Mapleton. Brilliant. So that's all of us today. Thank you all so much for um, your preparation and for participating today. I think it's just been amazing to travel across the globe and see so many different places caring for God's creation in different ways. Just so encouraging.
<laughs> okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for all our presenters. And uh, it's been really terrific. Um, so uh, let's just close in prayer. Lord, we, we've been inspired and excited and um, encouraged by what we've heard, the way in which you've uh, put us in charge of uh, uh, giving us responsibility for land and the way different organizations and individuals have got involved and and we thank you for the these stories and we pray uh, for wisdom as we go forward and seek to increase the awareness and involvement in in care of your creation through christian camps uh, in the future amen <laughs>